I have one opening statement. The welfare and economy of the American public would be seriously damaged <clears throat> by the strike now being threatened by the Flight Engineers Union against three major airlines, TWA, Pan American, and Easton. This action uh, would create uh, and have a significant impact upon our economy. And we have uh, made every effort during the past months to uh, bring about a uh, happy solution. This dispute stems from the recommendations made last year by the special commission I established that flight crews on jet aircraft be reduced from four men to three men. No one has questioned either the wisdom or the necessity of that recommendation. The commission also recommended that all presently employed flight engineers are to be given prior job rights on the three-man crews, and that any changes made in the transition would in no way prejudice their representational rights. The companies have agreed to pay all costs of training the flight engineers to enable them to serve on three-man crews. The Airline Pilots Association, in a related dispute involving Pan American Airways, agreed that arbitration was the responsible means of settling this matter. And the airline companies in this dispute have accepted my request, made in accordance with the applicable provisions of the Railway Labor Act, that all issues be voluntarily submitted to the final and binding judgment of a three-man arbitration panel composed of outstanding public, labor, and management leaders. But the Flight Engineers Union has ignored this request. They are threatening to strike for still more job and representational security. For wage increases of more than 20% over a three-year period, for reduction in working hours from 85 hours a month to 75 hours a month, and other demands. 1,800 men are threatening a strike, which would cause the immediate layoff of some 60,000 employees. The immobilization of 40% of the nation's airline service, and the loss of over a million dollars a day in internet, from international flights, which our balance of payments cannot afford. We have been under the Railway Labor Act procedures seeking a settlement for 17 months. But the flight engineers have not accepted the decision of the National Mediation Board. They have rejected the report of the Special Presidential Commission on Jet Crews. They have refused to accept the careful recommendations of the three presidential emergency boards. They have failed to cooperate with the long and thoughtful mediation efforts offered by the National Mediation Board the Secretary of Labor, and the Special Mediation Panel. And this morning, they rejected my request to submit these issues to arbitration. A strike could have, as I have said, a significant impact on our economy at this time. I strongly urge the flight engineers to meet their public responsibilities, to reconsider their action, and to either submit this case to arbitration or agree with the carriers on some other means of settling this dispute without any interruption of operation. President, should the flight engineers uh, not meet your request, would you then be prepared to go to Congress with a request for emergency seizure powers? We would have to wait till, uh, I'm hopeful that the flight engineers will heed my request and submit this matter, as I've said, to arbitration or find some other satisfactory method of settling it peacefully. Uh, we have been working for, as I've said, for more than a year because of the responsibilities placed upon uh, us by the Railway Labor Act, which covers the airlines, and I'm very hopeful that the engineers will reconsider this matter. If they do not, of course, we would then have to consider what our, would be the proper action. Mr. President. Yeah. Yeah. Following up uh, your recent statements on the economy, particularly uh, your speech at Yale the other day and the Solicitor General's yesterday, uh, is it the government's intention to play an active role in the major labor and industry wage and price discussions? And if so, how would this role be played? No, I think that uh, I'm not, uh, I've not read the uh, speech of the solicitor. Uh, my speech at Yale, I think, was uh, quite clear, dealt mainly, chiefly, with another subject, which was that we should attempt to engage in a dialogue on the very intricate questions which are involved in the management of a very complicated economy such as ours in order to maintain full employment and keep our economy moving. As far as the, we have attempted to indicate, and of course
course, uh, through the Council of Economic Advisors and by other means, are uh, concerned that uh, we uh, follow our policies, particularly in those basic industries which affect our competitive position overseas, that we follow policies that permit us to continue to compete and to continue to keep our economy moving. But these, uh, this is a free economy in the final analysis, and we have to attempt to uh, work out uh, solutions on a uh, voluntary basis. Mr. President, India is reported leaning toward the purchase of MiG aircraft from the Soviet Union and the equipment to manufacture such aircraft in their country. Uh, does the United States have any alternative plan or offer to uh, such an arrangement? And what uh, effect might this have on the uh, tensions within the area? Well, this is a matter which is being uh, dis considered in this government and also being considered uh, with other governments. It's a matter Ambassador Galbraith is returning to India at the end of the week, and will, I'm sure, uh, be uh, reporting to us on the situation as well as giving our views. And it would seem to me that we should keep it at that level at the present time. Yeah. In a note to the Japanese government today, Soviet Premier Khrushchev said that it is a criminal act that certain element, that a certain element is trying to prepare for a surprise attack on us by trying to attain the upper hand in the application of nuclear weapons. Would you address yourself to that remark? No, I hadn't seen that uh, statement. Uh, we are not preparing, uh, if he is referring to us, I don't know who else he might be referring to, but the United States is not, uh, quite obviously, has not been our policy. We made it quite clear what our policy is, which is to build for our own security. The United States has gone to great lengths, and as far as nuclear weapons, to secure effective means of control over their testing, I think Mr. the world knows the history of how this present series of tests began and uh, our great reluctance to commence them. And we have been engaged for many, many months in Geneva in the testing, test ban discussions and also in the disarmament conference to secure some effective means of bringing an end to the arms race, including the nuclear arms race, and also bringing world tensions under control. We are seeking to do so in uh, Berlin. We've been seeking to do so in Southeast Asia. And I'm confident that if there is uh, goodwill on both sides, that there can be a lessening of tensions. But uh, there has to be goodwill on both sides. President, yes. this is a question, sir, about a recent report called Does Overpopulation Mean Poverty? It recommended expanded government research on fertility control and expanded technical assistance to underdeveloped countries seeking to solve problems of overpopulation. Uh, what is your attitude toward those recommendations? Those rec I haven't seen those recommendations. I've always said from the beginning that these were matters which every country must decide for itself. This is not a matter as it goes to very basic national feelings, personal feelings. This is a matter which each individual, each family, each country must determine and cannot be determined by them by the actions of another country. Uh, in your Yale speech, uh, you spoke of deficits as not being necessarily inflationary or harmful. As you know, the attitude about deficits among the American people is largely an unfavorable one. I wonder, in light of that, if you could elaborate on why you think that deficits may not be bad or harmful. Well, it depends, as I said, I tried to say at Yale, and the key word is necessarily. I think there has been a feeling that deficits uh, uh, bring uh, inflation with them. And I attempted to make the point at Yale that uh, we had had uh, surpluses in the three years after the war, rather large budget surpluses, and still had uh, very sharp inflation, that we had had deficits uh, in 58 and uh, in 1962, and uh, that there had been a stable price level. The largest uh, deficit was in uh, 1958, $12.5 billion. The point I'm trying to make is that uh, what we must be concerned about is the trying to maintain the vitality of our economy. If, uh, and that the administrative budget, which is the budget people talk about, is not wholly revealing of the amount of money that the government takes in. If the administrative budget were balanced, the federal government would be taking in about $4 billion more than it was spending on the cash budget side. These are all rather complicated subjects because of the trust funds and all the rest. That has a deflationary impact on our economy. Now, we have to realize that we had a recession in 58 and a recession in 1960. We do not want to run through in this country, which is the so, on which so much depends, which is the uh, source of strength for the free world, we do not want to run into periods of recurrent recession. And one of the ways that has been considered to avoid this is by following a budget policy which is related to the economy. 
and not uh, related to uh, what I called uh, rather formal traditional positions which may not be applicable to the present time. And I thought the experience of Europe, which has had a decade of unequal progress, partly because they have managed their economy with some skill, partly because they're at a different period of growth, partly because of the common market, that it had some lessons for us. These are the matters I said at Yale that we should be talking about. How we can manage our economy, what should be our budget policy, what should be our fiscal policy. And uh, the automatic response that a deficit necessarily produces inflation is not necessarily true. Mr. President, uh, sir, a lot of people seem to feel that the idea of a democratic administration trying to win the confidence of uh, business is something like uh, the Republicans trying to win the confidence of labor unions. Uh, do you feel, sir, you are making headway in your effort? Uh, do you, have you seen anything to indicate that, uh, that business is coming around to your point of view on the economy and that uh, the confidence you ask for is being restored in the marketplace? Well, as I said what is necessary is not really whether uh, some businessmen uh, may be Republicans. Most businessmen uh, are Republicans, have been traditionally, have voted uh, Republican in every presidential election. But that's not the uh, important point, whether there's political agreement. Uh, the important point is that uh, the, uh, they recognize and the government recognize and every group recognize the necessity, as I have said, of attempting to work out economic policies which will uh, maintain uh, uh, our economy at an uh, adequate uh, rate of growth. That's the great uh, problem for us. They can uh, uh, be, uh, feel that, uh, as I said, that uh, they would be happier if there were a uh, Republican in the White House. but. Uh, there was a Republican in the White House in 1958, and we had a recession, and there was in 1960. So I would think, I think that what we have to realize is that I could be away from the scene, which might make them happy, and that you might have a Republican in the White House, but the economic problems would still be there. So that what I hope is we can address ourselves to those and not to a political matter, because after all, the presidential race isn't until 1964, and at that time, it would seem to me to be the appropriate time to argue politics. Right now, we should be concerning ourselves with the real problems of our country, which are of great interest to me economically, which are to them, which are to labor, which are to all American people. feeling in some quarters, sir, that big business is using the stock market slump as a means of forcing you to come to terms with business. One reputable columnist, uh, after talking to businessmen, obviously, reported this week their attitude is, now we have you where they want you. Have you seen any reflection of this attitude? I can't believe I'm where business, big business wants me. <laughs> uh, I, I read that uh, column in the, in the uh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, as a matter of fact, and I found that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Childs uh, made the point that uh, some, uh, as I believe his phrase was, rich men were quoted as having said what you said, uh, Mr. Roberts. I cannot believe that uh, anybody thinks that uh, in order to uh, take some uh, political, gain some political benefit, that it's a, a, uh, be a, it's a source of pleasure to them to see the stock market go down or see the economy have difficulties. I, I don't believe that uh, anyone who looks at our problems uh, at home and abroad could possibly take uh, that uh, partisan an attitude. So I don't accept that view. I know that uh, when things uh, don't go well, they uh, like to uh, blame uh, uh, presidents, and that's what uh, one of the things which uh, presidents uh, are paid for. But I think what we want to be concerned about, as I've said before, is not a personal dialogue as much as it is a dialogue on the problem of what tax policies, what budget policies, fiscal policies we should pursue, because if it were merely a matter of a, a party or personalities, we would not have had our experience that we had in the late 50s. So that shows there's something more substantive here. And this is what concerns, uh, I think, all of us, or should. Mr. President, yes, Mr. Uh, Senator Mansfield, a few days ago, uh, suggested a review of Far Eastern policies because he said they seemed to him uh, either mark time or, at worst, on a collision course. Do you think such a review is necessary? Well, we've been reviewing it, and as you know, we've been attempting, in the case of Laos, to work out a policy which would uh, prevent uh, either one of those situations. Whether we shall be successful or not, only uh, time will tell. I know that uh, we have put uh, large sums of money. The situation there is still hazardous. What is true there, of course, is true all around the world. This is a period of great uh, tension and change. But if the United States had not uh, played a part 
in uh, Southeast Asia for many years, uh, I think the whole map of Southeast Asia would be different. I am delighted, uh, as you know, I have the highest regard for Senator Mansfield, and I think we should constantly review, and I think as he suggested we should make judgments between what is essential to our interest and what is marginal. We have been attempting under great, with great difficulty to carry out a policy in Laos which would permit a neutral and independent uh, government there. In Senator Mansfield's speech, he used the examples of Burma and Cambodia. Those were the examples that were also used at the Vienna meeting by Chairman Khrushchev and myself in which we stated the kind of government that uh, we both said uh, we hope would emerge uh, in Laos. That is the commitment that was made by the Soviet Union and by the United States. Now we've moved to a different plateau and we're going to see whether that uh, commitment can be maintained. But uh, on the other hand, uh, if, and I'm sure Senator Mansfield, I know Senator Mansfield does not think we should withdraw because of withdrawal in the case of Vietnam, in the case of Thailand, might mean a collapse of the entire area. Mr. President, Mr. President uh, the Senate passed a number of restrictive amendments on the foreign aid bill besides uh, that limiting aid to Yugoslavia and Poland. Uh, do you think this reflected a growing disenchantment in the Senate on the whole question of foreign aid? And do you think such actions as that contemplated uh, by India in purchasing jets from the Soviet Union have anything to do with that disenchantment? Oh, well, it's, uh, we've carried it a long time, and uh, the uh, Senator Mansfield speech showed it's, uh, the world is still uh, with us and uh, still uncertain, and all of our effort and all of our sacrifice has not produced uh, the new world, but uh, it's not going to. What we are attempting to do is to maintain our position. There have been a good many changes in the communist uh, bloc in the last 10 years, and uh, some of those have been, uh, uh, should encourage friends of freedom. So what we want to do is maintain uh, our position and that of our associated nations with us in this effort, and not to desist in 1962 because the race is not over, and uh, we have not uh, been uh, completely, uh, uh, we have not come to uh, home port. We are still at sea now. Uh, I think we ought to stay there and continue to do the best we can. There was, as has been revealed in the press, uh, Mr. Kennan, Ambassador Kennan, who's been very realistic in his uh, appraisal of our relations with Yugoslavia is extremely disturbed about what has happened. He feels, in the story in the paper quoted him as saying that this has been a great gift to the Kremlin at this particular time. The, and uh, Mr. Cabot, our ambassador to Poland, both of these men are long experience. Mr. Kennan, probably the longest experience almost of any American in the studies of the uh, Soviet Union. Both of them regard uh, this action as a uh, major setback and as a great uh, asset uh, to uh, Moscow. I don't think we should uh, do those favors to them if we can help it. Mr. President, Mr. President, yesterday, Mr. President, in this same connection, you've had a great deal of trouble with the Democrats on other parts of your legislative program. Have you arrived at any new formula for persuading them to come along? On, on well, I think the Democrats, uh, except for a few Democrats who have uh, habitually uh, voted with the uh, Republicans, the Democrats have done uh, pretty well today up on the, for example, on the debt limitation. Every year during, I think, President Eisenhower's administration, except 1953, he had to ask for a change in the debt limit. Every time I voted for him to give him that power. Today on the final roll call on a measure which would have, instead of giving us our request of 308, would have rolled it back to 285 billion, which would have, of course, meant that every defense expenditure, space, agriculture, veterans, and every other commitment of the government would have been in great difficulty and would have been, of course, extremely difficult for us to maintain our, uh, meet our obligations. Uh, every Republican in the House, except nine, voted uh, against us. Now, uh, it passed, however, because the Democrats met their responsibility. They did in the House and the tax bill. They have on the trade bill. And uh, I think that... Uh, we do expect, however, that all these matters will not be made matters of party loyalty, and we have to get some support uh, from the Republican side. And on occasions uh, in the Senate, we certainly have gotten it. We now have a farm bill up coming next week. That farm bill can save $1 billion a year to the taxpayers of this country over a period of four years, $4 billion. Now, this is a vote which is in the best interest of American agriculture and in the best interest of the country and is in the best interest of the economy of the United States. I hope that this will not be made, as it's indicated, a party issue in which every Republican will then vote against us, and we will find ourselves with a very close vote on a matter which has the first chance of bringing some order 
out of what is a very chaotic situation. If we fail and our farm bill is defeated, we go back to the program which is in permanent legislation, the Benson program, which has brought us great uh, so-called, which has brought us uh, tremendous surpluses and expenditure of over six and a half billion dollars by the government every year. So here is a very good chance. And I think that uh, we have a right to expect that on these matters of great national import, that uh, at least uh, we will receive some help from across the aisle because on other occasions, many of us voted uh, to give uh, assistance to the President of the United States when he was a member of the opposite party on the question of aid to uh, the Poland-Yugoslavia matter. I voted twice to give President Eisenhower the flexibility he felt he needed in order to conduct foreign policy. He bears a great responsibility. The Congress does also. But I thought that he should have that power if the situation uh, required it. Uh, I would hope that uh, those who are on the opposite side would uh, also, at a time particularly when there are so many things which are encouraging in the world to us, would be uh, willing to uh, sustain us in uh, giving us a similar power. Mr. President. Mr. President uh, <coughs> yes. Sir, on the, on the farm bill, uh, you have said and others in the administration have said repeatedly that the present programs, because of their expense, cannot go on indefinitely. If Congress should refuse to enact your current program, would you feel required to request the Congress to repeal the existing price support programs without controls? Well, the choice, it seems to me, uh, is very clearly uh, the satisfactory provision is, to, is the one that we have suggested. Now, if we fail there, of course, then we have, as you have said, the permanent legislation in which we have price supports and no controls, which, of course, will pile our surpluses up bigger and, I think, depress our farm income. We would then have to consider what appropriate legislation would be asked for. But the bill we've sent is the one we need. We don't want a bill which has no support for the farmers. You can't very, we don't want to go to the Congress and say, now that you are refused to uh, permit us to have a balance between supply and demand of the kinds you have in tobacco and cotton, we're now going to pull out and have no support for the farmers. So that uh, this is the best uh, solution, the one we have before the House next week and which has already passed the Senate. Mr. President, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, in regard to the Hong Kong refugee problem, yesterday the colonial secretary said that uh, food and clothing relief would not uh, resolve the colony's problems, nor would emigration, but that Hong Kong would welcome the assistance of other governments in building hospitals, schools, and clinics, and so forth. Is the administration considering this type of assistance? We have it contributed very heavily, as you know, towards food. I'm not aware that any requests have been made for additional assistance, but we would certainly be prepared to consider it, and we, along with other governments. Mr. President. Mr. President, proposals for a senior service corps patterned after the Peace Corps for the older members of a population have been discussed by your Council on Aging at its first meeting. How do you view this? Well, I think that the Council on Aging, that's one of these things they're looking at, and I think they're going to make a report to me very shortly, and I think they'll give us some recommendations on it. Mr. President, Mr. President, do you feel the Latin American countries are making the contribution they should within the problems they can face on the Alliance for Progress? As some countries are uh, making a major effort. Some, in some countries, the effort is uh, slower. As you know, in nearly every country, they're dealing with staggering problems, including exchange problems, which have come, which are partly induced by the decline in uh, the price of the raw materials they're getting. So that uh, Latin America faces, uh, in many of the countries, uh, they're making a real effort. They face great problems, and I'm hopeful that the United States will be persistent in supporting the Alliance for Progress and not expect that uh, suddenly uh, the problems of Latin America, which have been uh, with us and with them for so many years, can suddenly be solved overnight merely by uh, a, uh, in a period of a few months. Mr. It's going to take a long time. But at least in some countries, they're making progress towards it. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President, sorry, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. A year ago, Wait sir. Wait just a second. And then we'll I'm sorry. In reference to your exchange of letters with Chairman Chris Jubb on Laos, with both of you suggesting that this might lead to settlement of other international problems. Could you comment on two aspects of that? One, is the Laotian formula in any way applicable to divided Berlin or divided Germany? And secondly, if it is not, is there still a hope perhaps that this might be a step towards another summit meeting for settling outstanding problems? No, I don't see the parallel in the, the situation is different in Berlin than it is in Laos, quite obviously. Obviously, if we can solve by peaceful means and uh, not only get an agreement, but make it work, and that both parties demonstrate a sincere commitment 
to uh, a solution of what has been a difficult problem over a period of time, then it would encourage us to believe that there has been a change in atmosphere and that other problems also can be subjected to uh, reason and uh, solution. That's why I regard the Laos matter as so important. We have to wait now and see whether we can make this agreement, which has been signed, uh, make it work. If we can, then it will be an encouraging uh, step uh, forward to more uh, amicable relations between the Soviet Union and the United States, and uh, we can discuss other problems. Nothing on the summit yet. Uh, President Chari of uh, Panama said at his press conference this morning that uh, the binational uh, commission, which will be set up to consider points of differences between Panama and uh, the United States, would have the power to consider renegotiation of the Panama Canal Treaty. I was wondering if uh, this was your attitude also, or what your uh, attitude is toward this interpretation of your... Well, I haven't seen, and I'd, I'd rather not comment on the c statement until I'd seen President Chari's statement in toto. I think the communique describes uh, quite clearly the responsibilities of the uh, commission, and, uh, it's, uh, and it's going to get to work right away. I'd have to look at his statement and read it in detail before I could tell whether about his interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we go up there. I, I, uh, uh, Mr. President, about a year ago, you sent to the Congress a greatly expanded space program, and I was wondering if you could give us your own assessment of how we stand technologically, how you think the American people as a whole have responded to the space effort, and whether you plan any major realignment, such as a bigger military role. Such, such as a what? Such as a bigger role for the military in space. Well, the military, starting at the end, the military have a, an important and significant role, though the primary responsibility is held by NASA, and is primarily peace, and I think that that proportion of that mix should continue. I think the American people have supported the effort in space, realizing its significance, and also that it involves a, a great many uh, uh, possibilities in the future, which are still almost unknown to us and just coming over the horizon. As far as where we are, I don't think that uh, the United States is first yet in space, but I think a major effort is being made, which will produce uh, important results in the coming months and years. Mr. President, uh, in view of the common market retaliation, uh, would you perhaps be prepared to concede that it was an error to uh, raise the uh, duties recently on uh, carpets and glass? No, no. Do you have any intention of rescinding it, or will it stand? No, it's going to stand. Mr. Carpets President. and glass were the unanimous recommendation of the Tariff Commission. They were very hard hit. We were quite aware of the fact that uh, actions would be taken by the Europeans. If we had had passage of the Trade Act, we could have then offered a package, of, an alternate package, which I think would have prevented retaliation. Retaliation is not uh, the most satisfactory device, but as you know, because we were, we were limited under present law and therefore were not able to be as forthcoming as we might have hoped. But there was a particularly drastic situation facing us in carpets and glass. And uh, the Tariff Commission found unanimously that uh, relief should be granted, and uh, we went ahead and granted it, and uh, I uh, would not change it. Mr. President, so <clears throat> I wonder if you think the congressman yesterday were justified who said that there had been pressure put on them to uh, get them to vote for the rise in the debt limit, and this pressure had come from the Defense Department to uh, people in districts with uh, large defense contracts. They were told that these defense contracts under negotiation might not be completed if they did not vote for the debt limit. Well, I think, uh, I, I'm sure, I hope that it was explained to everyone what the effect would be if we did not, we had to have a stretch out, we're not able to pay uh, our bills. And that would have been the situation. I recall very clearly in the fall of 1957, in my own state of Massachusetts, when there was a stretch out and the uh, contractors and others had to assume the, uh, pay their own bills, it not only uh, had a very uh, drastic effect on them, but according to the Brookings Institute and a good many other studies, it was uh, one of the factors which uh, helped uh, lead to the 1958 recession. This would have taken, in effect, in a period of four months, $2 billion out of our economy at a time when we need money flowing into our economy. So they were only being informed of what was a fact, which was that uh, we could not pay the bills uh, in some of these areas if we were not given the kind of flexibility which had been requested uh, of the Congress. It's the same flexibility that, as I've said, that President Eisenhower requested and which he received and which we have now received. Mr. President, President uh, while most of business doesn't certainly oppose the, your income tax uh, reduction plan, uh, many, of, many businessmen have said if you really want to give business and the economy a shot in the arm that you should give them a better break on uh, depreciation tax write-offs and so forth. Now, I know that 
A new schedule is coming out, I think, uh, within the month. But in addition to that, do you contemplate anything in this area to we help? We are going to, as I said before, by the uh, 6th of July, come forward with the quicker depreciation write-offs under Schedule F of a billion, two hundred million dollars. That could have been done any time in the last 15 to 20 years. We have been working on it now for a year. That's going to be important. In addition, under the tax bill itself, provides a very uh, important assistance to business if we are able to secure its passage by the Senate. And of course, the third provision of the tax bill is the standby tax authorities in case unemployment begins to move up, which will permit us to have a temporary tax reduction in many brackets. All those I regard as very important. Thank you. Thank you.